And we honor Thee, praise Thee, and thank Thee. We can't thank Thee enough for that grace. Bless us now that the focus of our worship may be on Thee. That this is what Thou hast done. Again, we remember every part of the body of Jesus Christ that we join. Some, some parts of the body are already rejoicing in glory. We thank Thee that we may know that they are there. Give us Thy blessing, Father, so that we may be aware of the joy of the saints gone past. But may we be faithful ourselves to remember the breadth of the body of Jesus Christ on earth. And so we thank thee that thou dost give us to be able to do foreign missions in the Philippines, that thou hast given us contact with saints who hold to these same doctrines, these same teachings taught in thy word and in the articles of faith with saints in Northern Ireland. In the island of Ireland as well in Limerick with the saints that we have gotten to know and love in Singapore with the churches in Australia we thank thee father for what they each are doing not only to maintain and to defend these truths, to reject what's contrary to it, but also to spread it, to take what thou hast so graciously given to them and to proclaim it to others. Bless the work of the saints in Northern Ireland in their broad use of the internet May we with them use that means to communicate the truth all over the world. May thy spirit convey that truth to the knowledge and encouragement of thy people, wherever they may be. Bless the church in Singapore too, Father, as they work in Malaysia. Bless their contact with the congregation that they established earlier this year further their witness in other areas. Bless the work of the saints in Australia as they have the ability to communicate with saints in Thailand and in parts of Africa. Gracious God, it is amazing to us where thou dost gather thy people and where thou dost give us contacts. We thank thee that the breath of the body of Jesus Christ could be experienced by us in these last five months with Jessica, a member of the Australian churches, to be with us. We pray that thou wilt give her safety in her travels back to her family and home and to her church. We rejoice in the gift of the breath of the body because when we see a part of the breadth of the body, then we are given a concrete evidence of the breadth, as well as the length and the height and the depth of the lie love for us in Christ. Bless us by blessing also our missionary here in the States. Encourage our mission committee as it seeks efforts to Spread the word in other parts of this country. Bless Reverend Brinesma, his wife, and their family and their work. Encourage the saints there in Pittsburgh. Bless them through the contacts that they make in the outward areas of, the, of Pittsburgh and in Pennsylvania and in Ohio. There too, O Lord, we rejoice that thou dost open doors and enable Maybe not preaching, but communication of the truth to be given, books to be sold and dispersed. But it's all about thee and thy glory, the truth about thee, the truth of thy grace, the truth that thou art a God who establishes a relationship of friendship. 
the covenant. We know that relationship. We delight in it. We experience what it means when thou dost come in and sup with us and we with thee. There's nothing sweeter than to know that thou art with us always. And so we grieve. We actually learn and strive to follow the example of the Apostle Paul who wept and grieved when fellow saint, fellow. Jews were, would reject that gospel and walked in darkness and in blindness. We pray that we may be urgent in our prayers for the neighbors, the people that we work with, the people that we live next to, that that word may, may go forth by means of our prayers and the witness that we give in the lives we live and in how we live them. Give us love for those neighbors so that we are fervent in our prayers for them. Give thy blessing, Father, to our congregation. Bless the elders as they go in and out among us, especially as they visit our homes. May we open ourselves to them. May this prove to be a profitable and blessed time. Bless the catechism instruction. May our children, all the other children and young people of the congregation have the preaching brought to them so that the gospel of Jesus Christ, its demands, its threats may be brought in a very direct and concrete way to them so that they may learn to know thee, the one true living God. We pray that may be so. Again, we are very conscious that we don't merit that grace to be given to our children. Our instruction is not as it ought to be. But Father, hear our prayer. Use, use the feeble means that we give. So that as even Eunice and Lois taught Timothy, and he learned, so we may seek to learn. Bless the Bible study season as it begins soon. Make us diligent to want to find ways that we can be in a disciplined way, ready to learn, to give ourselves to greater and further study, because we want to grow to know Thee better and better. And then our praise will be with greater sincerity. To Thee be the glory honor and power, now and forever. Amen. We're privileged to give, first of all, for the cause of the assistance of the foreign seminary students that are able to come to our seminary from other countries. And the second cause that we're privileged to give for is special education. May God bless us as we give. O oh, bless the man whom thou dost choose, and draw in love to thee. We shall be satisfied with thy abundant grace. And that's why praise waits in Zion, Lord, for thee. Let's sing the four stanzas, all four of 172.
we read from the Word of God this evening as we find it in Psalm 72. Psalm 72. In the Hebrew, the first verse reads, A psalm for Solomon. Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness, and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass as showers that water the earth. In his days shall righteousness flourish, shall the righteous flourish, and abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy. He shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. And he shall live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall be made for him continually, and daily shall he be praised. There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. May God bless the reading of his word to us. Our text is found in verses 18 and 19. Psalm 72, verses 18 and 19. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Just two quick thoughts by way of introduction. The first one is this. This is a, a prayer of David for Solomon. As you can see at the end of the psalm, Solomon's or David's life is about to end, and so he anticipates seeing <coughs> Solomon on his throne. But he makes it very, very obvious that as he prays, the kind of king and kingdom he asks that Solomon have. 
And it's a kind of kingdom that benefits those who are the citizens of it. Two implications. First, the thought that we've been saying of late, to be great in God's kingdom is not to be a king who is served, but to be great in God's kingdom is to be a servant to all. So the kind of king that David prays Solomon will be is one who will benefit. Yea, all the nations of the world shall be blessed in him. He takes care of the poor and the needy. And then we learn, this is the second implication, that instead of being on our own, our own king, ruling in our own castle, what we want to ask for is this kind of a king, and therefore a willingness on our part to place ourselves under that kind of a rule. The maturity of the first half of the third question, will you submit to church government? That's implied in this prayer, that that's the best place to be, under that kind of king, under that kind of rule. Will you submit to church government? Yes. This psalm shows why. Now when that kind of a king is envisioned and prayed for, then it leads to the doxology that we have as our text tonight. A text that one of the girls chose for this occasion. Blessed be Jehovah God, the God of Israel, who doeth wondrous things. Amen and amen. Blessed be Jehovah God. We just take that first part of the text of verse 18 as our theme. First of all, we look at the object that's receiving the blessing and the praise. Secondly, we consider the reason who does wondrous things. And finally, we consider the praise, the doxology that is given at the conclusion of this text as our praise. So the object, the reason, and the praise. Blessed be Jehovah God. David knows that his end is near. There were issues in his kingdom that occasioned him to anoint Solomon. He wasn't dead yet, so there was a time when there was a transition period a co-reign. David knows that his days on earth are coming to an end quickly. So he prays for Solomon. But it is impossible that as we hear David pray, and what he prays, and the extent of the kind of kingdom that he prays for, that it's pretty obvious that the Spirit is inspiring this prayer of David for another son of David. God had promised that David's son would sit on his throne forever. So it starts with Solomon. But it goes on. To all other sons of David, to the son of David, namely the Messiah that we know as Jesus Christ. The psalm is a 
a picture and foretelling of the kind of wisdom that Solomon would have. He would judge the people with righteousness, even the poor. It was very, very common in the world of that day that the king would take advantage of the poor. They weren't able to benefit him and his kingdom and his reign, and so he would take advantage of them. He would rule against them. The very second verse, the first part of his petition, righteousness unto the, king, uh, unto the king's son. He shall judge the people with righteousness, every part of them, the rich as well as the poor. And then the mountains shall bring peace to the earth and the little hills by righteousness. He speaks of the extent of the kingdom. From shore to shore, he speaks of the happiness of the citizens of the kingdom. Again, how many times he doesn't speak of the needy as receiving what they need under the rule of that kind of king. But now, for us, for you girls particularly, the awareness is that this is a rule that we pray for. For him who is our king. Jesus arose and he ascended and he sits at God's right hand. And there he rules. And he rules over all. Over all. The largeness of his kingdom is spoken of in verse 8. He shall have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now, we know that David's perspective was determined by his consciousness of the size of the world at that time. And we can say in the light of that, no, his kingdom isn't just from shore to shore. His kingdom is over all of the oceans and all the inhabitants of the oceans. His kingdom is ruling over all of the universe. From every part of it, the whole of the universe is under his dominion. He's controlling everything in the farthest part of the universe. Things that we don't even know about, or, but it's all a part of his rule and dominion for the sake of the righteous over whom he rules. He speaks of the duration of his kingdom in verse 5, 7, and 15. As long as the sun and the moon endure throughout all generations. In verse 7, in his days shall the righteous flourish, abundance of peace, so long as the moon endureth. And again, verse 15, he shall be cont made continually and daily shall he be praised. The size of the kingdom, the duration of it, the peace and the prosperity. Verse 3, the, the mountains shall bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. And not only in verse 3, but also in verse 7, in his days shall the righteous flourish and abundance of peace. It's a tremendously large kingdom, but it's a kingdom that's characterized by peace. Now, now think of how David had to do war so that Solomon could rule in the consequences of David's conquering kingdoms and all the taxes coming in from all of these conquered nations to David, to Solomon rather. No, at no time were the promises that God had given to Abraham fulfilled, but in this time of David and Solomon, from the great river the river Euphrates, all the way to the river Nile. The breadth of the kingdom that God said he would give to Abraham and to his seed forever. Fulfilled in Solomon. But even more broadly applied to Jesus Christ, the son of David. The subjection that's given to him. The willingness on the part of the other nations that are around them to acknowledge the rule. 
In verses 9, 10, and 11, They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him. His enemies shall lick the dust, the dust of his feet. The kings of Tarshish and the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba from the middle of Africa are going to acknowledge and offer gifts. All kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. And that results in not only a peaceful and quiet reign, but that results in a great deal of happiness for the subjects of that kingdom. And so verses 2 and 4 speak of their joy. Verses 12 through 14, He shall deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence. If others are taking advantage of them, they'll come to him for judgment, and he'll set it right. And precious shall their blood be in his sight. The death of God's saints is precious in his sight. The king so rules in his kingdom that even their death becomes noticed by him and he acknowledges it and honors the citizens of his kingdom. Tremendous words. Got to read it again to catch more and more of the flavor of how David was praying for Solomon, but by inspiration for the Messiah. Now, in our text, remember, David's praying for Solomon. But in our text, the doxology of praise is given not to Solomon, but to Jehovah God. Now just quickly a minute. Just look at those names. We use those names all the time, especially God. But humbly pray that every time you say God, you really learn to understand what that word means. God the very word God is a plural word. But God is one. Three in one, but one. The plurality that belongs to that name emphasizes every perfection. Everything that's right and good. Everything. All of them, all together, are found in Him who has the name Elohim. God. And now take every ideal and envision it to its utmost. And that's in God. That's what the name God means. Every perfection to its fullest belongs to to him who has that name. No wonder he's worthy of praise. Blessed be God. Jehovah. I am. And I know that we often first think that means not changing. Yes, that's a part of it. But before you get to not changing... I am means this. I am God. I am. I need nothing and no one. I am means I am self-sufficient. Everything that I need I have within himself. I am not dependent on anything outside of myself. I don't need you Jehovah now we've applied that many times here before 
And we've seen that what that means is that when God nevertheless is pleased to establish a relationship outside of himself, this Jehovah says, I want to have a relationship with you, the closest possible relationship. Then we can never think, well, now he needs me. God looked at Adam in the perfection of the garden and said, it's not good. He'd be alone. He needs. He needs a wife. He can't really do anything by himself. He's not going to be able to propagate. He's not going to be able to stay warm. He needs. But God says, I don't need. I am. Though I don't need you, that makes my wanting you and my having you even more wonderful. Then, I am means, and when I have that relationship, I don't change. I have always been self-sufficient. I've never needed. I've always had everything that I need in myself. I have everything. I am. And I don't change. He's Jehovah. He's God. Then he adds, David is the king of Israel. And he says, blessed be the God of Israel. The God of Israel. So this, this God, full of endless and infinite perfections, is pleased to take possession of a nation. A nation to whom he gave the name Israel, the princes of God. Not just to the Davids and to the royal family, but he looks at every single member of that kingdom. He looks at the children. He looks at the rich and he looks at the poor. And he says, you are princes in my kingdom. You're Israel. And I am the God of Israel. And David knows that that God of Israel, yes, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that's the individuals, but he's God of the nation. And that gave birth, that he gave birth to them as a nation when he, performing those majestic and tremendous wonders the world had never seen before in the ten plagues so that he brought them forth, he gave birth to them as an independent nation. They grew up as a part of Egypt. He gave birth to them. He baptized them when he brought them through the Red Sea. He led them and cared for them. He carried them and bore them. He nurtured them. He watched over them. He fed them. He gave them drink. He cooled them with the cloud by day and warmed them by the flower of fire at night. God was the God of Israel. You are my peculiar possession. I own everything. Every nation is mine. But Israel, well, there is nothing like the relationship that I have with them. That's what God meant. And now David looks at that God and he acknowledges him. To be Jehovah doesn't need Israel, but he is pleased to have that relationship with Israel. The God of Israel. And immediately he tells us this. God saved you, Julie. God saved you, Aaron. But when he saved you, he makes us a part of his family. Not the Vanatops, not the Compagners or Heisingas. He made you a part of his. That's your name. Israel. Princesses of God. God is worthy 
of the praise, of our praise as the God of Israel. One other thing, the object of the praise is identified as the one who has a glorious name, a glorious name, forever. Now remember what name is. It's so important, Jesus puts it as one of the first petitions in his prayer. You don't touch that name, except you speak it with great care. His name isn't a title. It isn't so much God, Jehovah, God of Israel. That's not what he means by name, his glorious name. Name is, is that, is this. That God. So beyond our ability to know, even, even Adam-like, pre-fall, he is so majestic. No, no creature, no perfect sinless creature is still able to know the Creator except the Creator do something. And that which the Creator did and does is He opens up the curtain. He takes away the covering. And He says, I want to show to you me. Now, I'm not going to show you all of me, but I'm going to show you something of me. I'm going to show you enough of me for you to be saved. I'm not going to answer every question. I'm not going to explain everything. But I will show myself to you. That revelation that God gives of himself is his name. And that revelation is glorious. Glorious. We can tell about ourselves a little bit in an essay, in an autobiography. We can sing our praises. God's revelation of himself is glorious. Remember Isaiah 6? God reveals himself in heaven on a throne high and lifted up. Here comes, standing before him, sinless angels, seraphs. And as they stand before him, they got to cover their eyes and they cover their bodies. because of the glory. Moses wanted to be sure that God would lead Israel after the golden calf incident. He prayed, show me thy glory. God showed him his glory. He put him in a very narrow cleft of a rock. God passed by, and as he passed by, God put his hand over that opening so that, so that Moses couldn't see until God went by. And all that Moses saw is the figurative backside of God. And the glory was so brilliant that it adhered to Moses so that when he came down to the people, he had to wear a veil. They didn't have a Bible. They didn't have the revelation written. They had to talk about it. This is a part of the glorious revelation, the glorious name of God. Got your own? Sure. Do you have to do this once in a while? You know what it's going to say, so sometimes do you not want to read it? He 
he comes with all of his brilliance. And that brilliant revelation demands that you know him, that you honor him, that you love him. Love him. The glorious name. Jehovah, God, God of Israel, who has a glorious name. He's the object. Why? Well, because of who he is. But also the text says, who does wondrous things. There's sometimes that there's words that you, you just can't put a good word on to get it to our understanding. And so the word wondrous is that marvelous, extraordinary, surpassing, beyond one's ability to understand. There's that, there's that little part of verse 28 of Isaiah 40. That little part right at the end, it kind of catches you unawares. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? That the everlasting God, Jehovah, the creator of the ends of the earth, who fainteth not, neither is weary, and there is no searching of his understanding. There it is. That Jehovah, there's no ability to search his understanding. He doesn't need counselors, Romans 11 says. He doesn't need advisors. He doesn't need helpers. No one has ever been his counselor. Of him, through him, unto him are all things. Now, David writes this about Solomon. And he began to see some of the glory of Solomon's kingdom. But Solomon ruled in such a way that he built a palace for him. And he built the temple for God. And we read that gold was so common, it was as the stones on the street. David foretells the coming of the queen of Sheba who was rather well, speculative. I've heard rumors. No rumor is ever as big as what you hear. It can't be true. And she looks and she asks questions. And then, and then as a truly wise woman, she doesn't just ask Solomon. She listens to what his servants say and his soldiers. She listens to what the needy and the citizens of the kingdom say. And she steps back and she says, the half wasn't told me. No one's so wise in all the world. It surpasses one's ability to get it. We can't, we can't even describe the kingdom and the glory of the kingdom of Solomon. And then you look at the kingdom of the Messiah. And the kingdom of the Messiah is, well, it's not that which he is doing now. Yes, he fought as a king. He fought against sin and Satan, and he conquered him while he was on earth. And he sits in might and dominion now, ruling over all things, so that Satan is subject to his will. And all of the demons, all the principalities and powers, and the spiritual wickedness in high places, they're all under his control but this is all preliminary. It's a few thousand years of preparation for a kingdom that's going to last forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And the glory of it. And now don't think, don't let your mind go right away what it will be like for me to be there. 
Because that's not going to be a part of the glory of the kingdom. Yeah, it will. It will. But that's not where that glory really centers. Jesus said, I want those, Father, whom thou hast given me to be with me in paradise, that they may behold my glory. That they may behold me. Because even in heaven, just like now, it's not about us. It's all about him. It's not, are things going to work out for me? Are things going to be okay? No, it's all about him. Then too, and then especially. But what a kingdom Solomon had. But then be careful what you say about the kingdom of Solomon. Because Solomon brought it to disgrace. For all its wisdom, he brought in temples of other gods to satisfy the wives that he had. His disgraceful apostasy deserved that God would punish that kingdom. And he did. God did. He punished that kingdom for what Solomon had done. He took all of its glory and honor and he broke it apart. Ten of the twelve brought away. You've got two left. Small. And then watch the other sons of David and how they ruled. There was a Jehoshaphat and there was a Hezekiah. There was an Asa. But the nature of the rule of the sons of David and the kind of kingdom that they had. It's a wonder that it survived, that the throne of David survived. It's a wonder, it's a wonder surpassing our thought because it's a wonder of grace. David knew what it was to deserve punishment and death That's why Nathan had to say to him, Thou shalt not surely die for what you've done. The wonder, the wondrous works that God performed in Jesus Christ isn't seen in the glory of Solomon's kingdom, but in that God would not forsake that kingdom when it deserved to be that God preserved 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. The wonder, the wondrous things is that God brings to us a powerful convicting spirit so that we recognize the dirt, the sinfulness, and we confess the sins. Seminary and eBay said it last week. What do parents teach their children in their words and in their actions? That we're good, that we're the best? No. They teach to manfully fight against sin and Satan and his whole dominion. And that fighting against sin and Satan and his whole dominion begins when we say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. To God. To each other. That's fighting sin and Satan. And no human, you know how hard it is to say I'm sorry? How many times you've done it in the last week? It's grace. 
Grace that makes us say it. Grace that humbles. Grace that gives us the wisdom to admit it. And grace then to stand. Because that same grace that enables us to say, I'm sorry, is the grace that says, I've not left you yet. I still love you. I have forgiven you. I declare you're righteous. I look at you as if you've never done anything wrong. I look at you as if you did everything right. That's wondrous works. I don't mean to say anything badly about your parents. I'm going to judge them by me. All four of you. It isn't because your parents taught you so well that God enabled each one of you, two of you tonight, Cody and Mitch before, to stand and say, I'm not my own. I belong to my Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. I repeat, it's not because they have done such a good job. This is not to sing the praises of parents. This is to say, in spite of what parents did, and those parents, in honesty, are going to say just that. God, you use weak means. Did they confess as they ought? No. Wondrous. We praise him for his surpassing wonderful works. The wonder that he can work in all of you, in all of us, be able to say what you did, Aaron. It looks like it was bad. But God meant it for good. And it is good. That's a wonder. That's grace. That's power that no human can put into a soul, to a heart, into a mind. That's wondrous things. So we bow and we return love. And even if it, it doesn't get in us yet, or we don't understand it all, it surpasses our understanding. We say, he said it and it's true and we're going to believe it and we can't wait until he can show us all the details of why it was good and how good it was and is. But he is worthy of our praise. For he has done wondrous things. And there's so many other examples. Just in your lives. The short while I've known them. that you have grown to realize you have a God that is so wonderful and you want to live and follow him. Blessed, blessed be Jehovah. This is a doxology of praise. When he gets to this part, He's not giving an exposition. He's no longer explaining. He, he can't. It's beyond explanation. At this point in the psalm, David is led by the power of that inspiring spirit to give exultant expression. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who doeth wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever. Expressions of adoration, expressions of admiration, expressions of wonder. 
the height of which words just fail us. And then he adds, from sea to sea, let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Every part. David anticipated that as a fulfillment of the promises that God had given to, to Abraham. David knew those promises. And as he conquered kingdom after kingdom, he saw it all being realized. And so with good reason he prays that the glory of God's name would fill the earth from shore to shore. Daniel would see it in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, that, that stone, that little piece of stone that was cut out of a mountain. Without hands it was cut out and it rolled down the side of that mountain and it crashed and just crashed to tiniest dust, to smithereens, that great statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up for himself. Here came that little stone and it rolled down and that stone grew and it filled the whole earth. Fill the whole earth. The good news of Jesus Christ went from the God of Israel, the nation, the descendants of Abraham, to Galilee, to the nations round about, to Cyprus and to Crete, to Sidon and Tyre. He went to Singapore, he went to Ireland, he went to the Netherlands, it even came to America. He went to all parts of Africa. The knowledge of the revelation of God has gone over all the world and when it hits everywhere, then Jesus will come. And then He'll have a new kingdom. And every part of that glorious new heavens and new earth combined together, new heavens and new earth, will be filled with nothing but the praise and the glory of God. No dark corners where the knowledge isn't there yet. No spot where somebody reluctantly worships or somebody refuses to worship. Every inhabitant of that new heavens and new earth will give perfect praise to Jehovah God, the God of the new Israel. Unto God Almighty joyful Zion sings. He alone is glorious, doing wondrous things. Evermore, ye people, bless his glorious name. His eternal glory through the earth proclaim. Christ shall have dominion over land and sea. Earth's remotest region shall his empire be. Amen. And amen. We're going to sing 197. That's versified. Amen. So let it be. Amen means so let it be. So the very first thing that an amen means is what was spoken is true. And it's only truth that was spoken. But when David repeats the amen, then we with him want to say, that shows the strength and the vehemence of the desires that God be praised now and forever everywhere. Amen? Amen? And amen. Our Father, we thank Thee that thy word is truth. We thank thee for the encouragement that thou dost give, and our prayer is that while we stumble and mumble about these words, thy Holy Spirit will take this preached word and let it expand in the meditation of our hearts. As we talk about it, may it grow. Do wondrous things through us and in us, all to the glory of thee, our God. 
thanks. Thanks, Father, for all that thou hast done. For Jesus' sake, amen. One hundred ninety seven will use now, taken from this portion of Psalm Psalm seventy two, one hundred ninety seven. Let's sing both stanzas. Jehovah bless you and keep you. Jehovah make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. And Jehovah lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.